Good morning, all. Welcome to this beautiful hall, and uh, despite the weather, um, and I think it's particularly exciting to see young children here. Um, I'm sure they all want to learn about Nubian culture. This is great. Uh, I didn't have opportunities when I was that age. So very pleased to, to see that. I know there's fall break for, for, for quite a few schools, and uh, it's, it's wonderful that you actually took the opportunity to bring your children, those of you that did. Um, so it's uh, truly a privilege for me to participate in this event. Marietta just said as I walked in, he dies for this day. Well, I actually live for the day, but um, it's, it's a wonderful day today. I, I hope for those of you who are attending just this lecture, you're aware that we have three um, top awards uh, in research for the campus, and we celebrate them today. We have three talks back to back in this hall, and, uh, and then the, the uh, recipients are, are uh, recognized at a dinner tonight. So um, it's, it's, it's great to hear about our faculty and about research. It's a day that we, we celebrate all our faculty do. Um, and it's particularly special today because um, we have uh, a very special guest, Dr. Luann Ade. Um, who's in the audience, and she will be up here in a second. Um, she's here to initiate the inaugural Luana Day Award um, and, and the distinguished lecture, of course. Um, this award, the Luana Day Award, will uh, replace the Research and Scholarship Distinction Award that we've given now for a few years. Um, it basically formally evolves that award into a uh, into our top named research award in the humanities and social sciences. Um, we're very pleased that uh, several of the previous awardees are here. I will ask them to briefly stand. Uh, they've all got wonderful careers behind them and ahead of them and have done a lot. So I'll ask Tom Hurtle to stand up. Tom, congratulations. <laughs> Ronnie Wilbur. Ronnie, thank you. And Marianne Barouche is in the back there. If you missed her lecture, I hope, well, any of the lectures, I hope you go and look for their uh, recorded bits, because uh, the poetry that Marianne talked about, for sure, I remember very well, and, and, and as, as did Ronnie and Tom. So, um, well, Purdue alumna, alumna, uh, Dr. Luann Ade, has very generously endowed the Luann Ade Award. Uh, to annually recognize a Purdue faculty member for recent outstanding accomplishments in the humanities and social sciences. So that's what we're celebrating here today. Uh, Dr. Ade is the Lauren D. Bain Distinguished Professor Emerita in Public Health and Medicine at the University of Texas School of Public Health in Houston. Uh, she came to Purdue for her master's and doctoral degrees uh, in sociology uh, after receiving a bachelor's in ag econ at uh, Texas Tech. She has pushed the boundaries. I've looked at her a record, and it's quite impressive. She's pushed the boundaries of understanding um, in, in health sciences and access to health care. Uh, Purdue actually recognized her with a, an honorary doctorate in social sciences in uh, 2004. Uh, she has authored 16 books. Any of you who's written one knows how long that takes. Um, she served on many boards and commissions for the National Academy of Medicine, National Cancer Institute, uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, HRQ, and she's been inducted in the National Academy of Medicine for her life, lifetime scholarly accomplishments. So an extremely uh, well-recognized, renowned scholar, teacher, and mentor. Uh, please welcome Dr. Luana Day to the stage. Well, it is truly an honor and privilege for the Purdue Research and Scholarship Distinction Award in the Humanities and Social Sciences to be renamed the Luann Ade Award. And it is a special uh, pleasure to be able to celebrate and acknowledge the contributions, the achievements of Professor Michelle Busan and her scholarly excellence. As I reflected on the criteria that I hope would govern the conferral of this award, it is apparent that Professor Busan has met and embodied these particular criteria in her own uh, excellent and impressive scholarly pursuits. The criterion first 
that I would hope would govern and did indeed govern the conferral of this award is to ask enduring questions. That is, those fundamental questions that universally compel answers across time and geography. Professor Poussin has posed the enduring question of how do societies affect the health and well-being of those persons who live within them through studying the diseases of the peoples of the ancient Nile River Valley in Egypt and Nubia, and the likely impact of economic and social transitions on their physical soundness. This question fits squarely in a burgeoning field of public health addressing the social determinants of the health of populations. A second criterion is that of how do we innovate and strengthen the methods that we employ in addressing these enduring questions. Professor Busson has employed multifaceted, contextual, integrative, and interdisciplinary methods across the fields of anthropology, bioarchaeology, and paleopathology in addressing this enduring question. This is moving into the future from our silos to the integration and interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary look at our work. Third, to maintain and manifest the highest standards of science and scholarship. Professor Busson's work is recognized nationally and internationally for its rigor, its relevance, and originality. Congratulations, Professor Busson. It is a real pleasure to be sharing in this special occasion to honor you and your work. Uh, I now invite the department head and professor of anthropology, and my friend Ellen Grunbaum, to the stage. As the nominator of this year's award, she will introduce Professor Michelle Busson, who's a professor of anthropology. Um, and I didn't do this in the beginning. Somebody will remind me later. My name is Suresh Garamella. I'm the executive vice president for research and partnerships. So. <laughs> Thank you. Trying to discover humanity's ancient past, an enduring question, has been likened to doing a jigsaw puzzle with 95% of the pieces missing. Michelle Buzan's anthropological work asks complicated questions about ancient peoples, requiring both the hardy, patient, trowel work we associate with archaeology and advanced scientific techniques in the lab. She studied anthropology at Loyola University and University of California, Santa Barbara, with her late advisor, Philip L. Walker, and she did postdoc a postdoc in Alberta. But it was her involvement in many uh, excavations around the world that probably marked her as someone who was very special early on. And then she turned to Sudan. Michelle came to Purdue in uh, what was then the Department of Sociology and Anthropology um, when, uh, in 2007. And when I first met Michelle the following year, um, when we formed the Department of Anthropology, she energetically explained to me that she urgently needed that laboratory space Purdue had promised. <laughs> Some of you may find this familiar, um, but her research materials could not be shipped out from Santa Barbara until there was space. And I'm so pleased that she has her, her lab and her space to work and that she's chosen Purdue as the place to do so much. Um, in the years since then, I've seen her with her students gathered around a lab table of research materials, puzzling over whether a particular notch in the bone means some sort of paleopathology or not. And she's also been involved in shipping boxes and research materials and equipment back and forth 
forth to a country that was under sanctions. And so we had a lot of challenges with paperwork. And then I've also seen her in the mornings at the dig site, waking people up before dawn and getting them excited about taking the walk, well, after they've had their coffee, taking the walk out to the dig site for a day of measuring, mapping, and digging. Her work has been supported by many grants, the National Science Foundation especially, in the, and National Geographic. She's published 35 articles and, or so and been featured in the public press and media, everything from Purdue's alumni magazine to a National Geographic special. So at Purdue, Michelle is a superb mentor, a superb colleague, and her mentorship of both graduates and undergraduates is without uh, comparison. She's um, instilled a passion for high quality research in many uh, undergraduates. She's done numerous research internships and honors projects with undergraduates, and several have published in the Purdue, in the uh, Journal of Purdue Undergraduate Research. And she's also launched many successful graduate students who are now doing their own work, uh, following in her footsteps in bioarchaeology and leading in new directions. So it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Professor Michelle Buzon, to give her Luann Aday distinguished lecture. And we really are honored that Luann Aday could be here with us today to hear it. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming out for my talk today. And thank you so much for the, the kind introduction. That was really, really nice to hear. It's been wonderful to have Ellen as my department head. And uh, she's been the department head for nine of the 10 years that I've been here today. And you know, we have, she's kind of a kindred spirit for me because she also works in, in Sudan as a cultural and a medical anthropologist. I'm really honored to have the first Luanne Day Award. And it's so nice to meet Dr. Day today. Um, I greatly appreciate the support of my research at all levels at Purdue. And uh, I'll talk today about some of the different things I've been doing over the last two decades, really, but especially the last few years of research where we've had some really exciting um, findings. So a little bit about Ellen's uh, integration into my research. During the last three seasons of fieldwork, Ellen joined my team at Tombos to expand and strengthen our connections with the local community and school. You can see her pictured here outside of our dig house with some of my graduate students. Um, I've had a number of graduate students participate in fieldwork and laboratory research, as well as several undergrads, as Ellen mentioned, who've completed projects in my lab with skeletal materials. And some of them you can see pictured here are published in the Journal of Purdue Undergraduate Research. And it's been great to introduce some of these students um, to doing in, uh, original research Research, and they've moved on to several different careers, some in nursing, some in biological lab work, some in law school, uh, as, as well as graduate school in bioarchaeology. I'm also really grateful for the funding and support of my work from the College of Liberal Arts, and they've enabled lots of opportunities for me to communicate my work with the media and in public venues. In the Office of the Executive Vice President for Research and Partnerships, in addition to conferring this award and arranging this lecture, has been really integral in navigating through the regulatory requirements of doing field research in Sudan. It's required a lot of paperwork and a lot of time, and I thank the staff for their really cheerful assistance in the process. And finally, I'm really excited to have my family here today. My parents and my brother came in, and my husband and son are here to listen to my lecture. I thank them for their support as well. Okay, on to the good stuff. I'm sorry I developed a cold over the weekend, so I may need a few swigs of water. Today I'm gonna to tell you about some tales from the tombs of Tombos. I have to thank Ellen for that great alliteration in my title while we were uh, brainstorming. Tombos is the Egyptian Nubian archeological site in Northern Sudan where I've been working for almost two decades. I'll start by setting the stage, introducing you to some of the chronological and social context of my research, some information about how I read the bones and burials of the people who lived in this ancient town, and then I'll share some biographies of individuals that we've developed through research over the years. And I welcome you to check out the webpage for our archaeological project. You can see it here. It's tombos.org. And we update the blog with news from our excavations as well as research as it comes out. Situated in Northeast Africa, the ancient cultures of Egypt and Nubia lived along the Nile River Valley. 
ancient Egypt is this area here, so mostly where modern Egypt lies, south to the Aswan Dam. And ancient Nubia is this area to the south, modern southern Egypt and northern Sudan. My work at Tombos focuses on archaeological remains that begin about 1400 BC during the 18th dynasty of the New Kingdom period, referred to as the Golden Age of Pharaohs. So it's about this time here. This is less than 100 years before one of the most famous ancient Egyptians, King Tut. During this time, pharaohs of the Egyptian empire concentrated on expanding to lands to the north and south to gain resources. Nubia, Egypt's neighbor to the south, was conquered in Egypt in order to access resources such as gold, cattle, and connections to other luxury goods. Egyptian officials and staff established settlements and temple towns in Nubia. After the fall of the Egyptian empire, we have what's referred to as the Dark Ages of Nubia, with few historical records and archaeological sites. The site of Tombos, you can see it's located here in northern Sudan, along the Nile, was used for several hundred years and starts about 1400 BC and ends around 650 BC, which is the Nubian Nabatan dynasty, when Nubia succeeds in conquering Egypt. So just as the Egyptian New Kingdom pharaohs ruled Egypt and Nubia, these Nubian pharaohs ruled uh, throughout the Nile Valley north to the Mediterranean. Tombos is located in Upper Nubia along the Nile at the southern frontier of Egypt, Egypt's territorial empire. So Egypt was in control of all of this area down to about here. Uh, they also placed some temples and, and other kinds of structures further south. As a cemetery at a key Egyptian colonial center with continuity through this still poorly understood transition, recent work at Tombos and some other sites in the region has provided new data to understand this period. My work at Tombos has been a collaborative effort with Stuart Tyson Smith from the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's an Egyptologist and archeologist, as well as a famed consultant on movies depicting ancient Egypt. You can see him here on the set of Stargate, one of his first works. We combine my specialty in bioarchaeology, the excavation and analysis of human remains, with his expertise in materials and textual analysis to create a picture of life and death at Tombos. My presentation today will contain many photographs of human skeletal remains and burial features from the site. Mary Moza was the viceroy of Nubia for Egypt. He's a regal official who ran the Egyptian colonies in Nubia. He left many inscriptions along the Nile, including one at Tombos. And these large inscriptions were placed high on boulders along the Nile and could be seen from boats heading north on the river towards Egypt. You can see in this photograph, there's some prisoners depicted on the inscription. And many of these inscriptions contain messages along the lines of, I came, I saw, I conquered. One of his stela mentions the recruitment of soldiers for the Egyptian colonial army for a campaign in the territory from the ancient fortresses of Bakai to Taroy, along the Nile here. And really exciting, our work in the last two seasons, but especially the last season, uncovered a large fortification wall in the ancient town of Tombos. We now believe that Tombos is actually this Egyptian fortress of Taroy. And as you can see in this picture, the ancient wall is under the modern town and agricultural fields. Because of this, we have very little preserved of that ancient town. Our team worked in a variety of locations, including excavating in town streets, house courtyards, um, paying somebody to, to dig up their newly dug house foundation for the season, and, uh, and then put all the, all the dirt back in. In ancient Egyptian society, ideas about ethnic and cultural identity are well documented. Egyptians depicted themselves and the people of the surrounding cultures in very specific ways. This drawing is from the tomb of New Kingdom Pharaoh Seti I. It depicts a stereotypical Libyan, Nubian, Asiatic, meaning from the area of Palestine and Israel, and an Egyptian. You can see here that the Nubian and the Egyptian are shown to be quite different, even though in reality they were much more alike. Similar to what we see in modern times, Egyptians didn't always portray their enemies, such as the Nubians, in completely positive or truthful ways. Here pictured are King Tut's sandals. King Tut put prisoners, especially some Nubian prisoners, on the foot on his feet so he could step on them every day. 
The funerary practices in Egypt and Nubia were quite distinct. Egyptian burials were generally placed in an extended position on their back and inside a coffin. You can see the remains of the coffin here. With tomb chapels and pyramids for the wealthy. Egyptian burials also include specialized grave goods designed to aid the deceased in the afterlife, and I'll show you some pictures of, of those in just a bit. Nubian burials, in contrast, were in a flexed position. You can see this individual with arms and legs flexed on their side, and placed upon beds or cowhide, buried under tumuli. There's this one here, a circular mound often decorated with stones. So what can these patterns tell us about who lived in the community at Tombos? Mortuary practices at the site reflect both Egyptian and Nubian ideas. We have Egyptian style pyramid and chapel tombs in this area here in purple. Over here in pink, we have Egyptian style underground chamber tombs. And this area in yellow here, we have Nubian style tumuli. Tombos appears mostly Egyptian at the start of its use, but as the empire crumbles, Nubian practices, such as this field of tumulus graves, become more common. And interestingly, in the post-Egyptian period at Tombos, there is an unprecedented entanglement of Egyptian and Nubian cultural features, really a blending of the two sets of practices. Egyptian colonists settled at Tombos during the New Kingdom and worked together with the local Nubians to create a multicultural and biologically mixed community that continued to, th to thrive long after the fall of the Egyptian empire and the end of the colonial government. This burial here includes an Egyptian style coffin, you can see sort of right along the edge of the body. Um, also Egyptian style scarabs that tell us when it's from. But then also a Nubian style bed, you can see another outline over this way. Nubian style pottery, a metal bowl, a box with a cow motif that tends to be Nubian style. He also had a large collection of iron weapons, which are some of the earliest ones found in Nubia. In reconstructing who lived at Tombos, we search for multiple lines of evidence. Another source of data to identify immigrants in archaeological sites is strontium isotope analysis. Strontium concentrations and ratios differ according to the variations in local geology. The bio biologically available strontium present in soil and groundwater is incorporated into the local plants, animals, and people. My work has established the strontium variability and provided the baseline data for the development of this method in the region. During the Egyptian rule of Nubia, immigrants came to Nubia from Egypt. At Tombos, with our fine chronological control determined from artifacts with pharaoh's names and ceramic styles. So for instance, you see these various layers of burials that have come from one tomb. We can date each layer of the, of the burials using these artifacts, such as scarabs with, with pharaoh's names and specific ceramic styles. And we've determined that the highest number of immigrants came in the earliest periods when the community was being established. You can see here in this one, over 50% in blue have strontium isotope values that come from Egypt. Biological variability is traced through the shape and skulls of the shape and size of skulls and teeth, provides additional clues about the population composition. Data from Tobos show that the community wasn't just a group of immigrants, a, a, a group of Egyptian immigrants living in isolation, but that they intermarried and formed a new society with the local Nubians. Through the combined analyses of burial practices, strontium isotopes, and biological variability, we can study the social factors involved in transformations and population composition that led to new patterns of identity at Tombos that were nigh, neither wholly Nubian or wholly Egyptian. I'm also interested in reconstructing a picture of health, disease, and life experiences for the people I research. Paleopathology, the study of ancient disease, provides methods to trace these signs. While it is very uncommon to be able to determine cause of death in a skeleton, we can document injuries, both accidental and traumatic. And in general, the community at Tombos led lives that didn't include many physical injuries or evidence of tough physical labor. We can also get a glimpse of the conditions that people lived with during childhood and adulthood. Lesions on the skeleton that reflect life conditions only develop with illnesses that affect a person in the long term, something experienced for at least some weeks. 
The lesions pictured here in the eye orbits, it's called Cribra orbitalia, represent deficiencies in essential nutrients, such as vitamin C, iron, and folic acid. Infectious diseases also can leave an identifiable pattern, such as the lung infection associated with tuberculosis that has affected the spine of the person pictured here. As you'll see in the coming slides, the people of Tombos come from a relatively affluent status. Our burials likely represent Egyptian administrative bureaucrats and other skilled workers, rather than the agricultural laborers that made up the majority of the other parts of the population. We considered these burials to range from sort of a middle class of administrative workers and artisans to the elite Egyptian officials. Thus, the remains at Tombos are part of the picture of the Egyptian-Nubian interaction for a particular segment of society. Now that I've given you a general overview of the Tombos community, I'll begin with some of the individual biographies that we are developing. Our excavations at Tombos, especially during the last three years, have been really fruitful. Some of my descriptions will be osteobiographies, meaning that I'll, I'll incorporate what I can read from the skeleton with the material cultural remains. I'll highlight some of the finds at Tombos that tell us about the people through their burial practices and some of their more unusual physical conditions. One of the most important individuals at Tombos was a man named Siamun. His tomb included a large Egyptian-style pyramid and chapel. You can see what was left of it here, the mud brick foundation, and this is the reconstruction of how it would have appeared when it was first built. The structure of his tomb reflects elite burial traditions from the Egyptian capital, Thebes, especially these ceramic cones stamped with an inscription. Let's see here. As read on his funerary cones, Siamun held the title Scribe Reckoner of the Gold of Kush, responsible for the administration of gold production and the assembly of annual tribute in, Nub in Nubia. Kush is the name that the ancient Egyptians gave their southern neighbor. The inscription on his funerary cones also included his mother, which is really nice that he talked about his mother in his <laughs> funerary crown. Her name was Warren, the mistress of the house. Mistress of the house was a common title for elite women, reflecting their ideal role in, in charge of household matters. It's interesting that it's his mother, not his wife. Usually we have the wife being uh, mistress of the house, so we're not sure what happened with Siamun here. <laughs> Ceramic cones were also found in the tomb of T, simply stamped with his name. You can see it here. It's kind of an unusual funerary cone. His burial was largely intact inside the remains of a poorly preserved but high quality coffin with painted decoration. Um, there were faience and stone and uh, inlaid eyes and eyebrows on it. A finely carved Ushabti, this little figurine here, still lay in place by his head and was inscribed with his name and the titles Scribe and Wab Priest, an administrative role participating in funerals. There were four polychrome canopic jar stoppers with human heads. Canopic jars were an important part of the mummification procedure as they held the organs after removal. He was an older individual with no signs of poor health. In the middle class chamber tomb area of the cemetery, we have the burial of a man about 50 years of age in a decorated coffin. This is what coffins look like generally. They're mostly some paint adhering to dirt. Strontium isotope analysis indicated that he was in fact an Egyptian immigrant, so came, came early in the, in the founding of this community. The shape of the entire momiform coffin was preserved, although decoration only survived at the foot end. You can see little bits of paint down here. The name and figure of the god Duamutef was preserved, along with large sections of inscription. This was one of the first readable coffins that we found at Tombos. I was still a graduate student when we excavated this. When the inscription became visible, I called my colleague Stuart over to where I was excavating to see it. And in his excitement, he started reading the inscription out loud. Do you know what happens when you read an inscription out loud? <laughs> For those of you who like mummy movies, you know what happens next. So I immediately stopped him and saved us all from the curse of the mummy. We still have a good laugh over that, and it's been many, many years. <laughs> Inside the coffin were two Ushabti figurines. You can see them, this area down here, alongside his legs. 
One was completely eaten by termites, but preserved the distinctive mummy-form shape of the Ushapti. And the head and the feet of the second Ushapti were damaged, but almost the entire inscription was preserved along the body. And the inscription contained his name, Tahut, and the standard spell from the Book of the Dead. Egyptians conceived of the afterlife as kind of a rustic paradise, but life and death came with a price. There were fields to be tilled, canals to be dug, and so on. The gods called upon the dead to perform these tasks. Ushabtish, you can see some pictured here, these fancy ones, would leap up and say, here I am, and substitute for the deceased, should the gods call upon them to work in the divine fields. This here is the standard Ushabti spell from the Book of the Dead. Tahut's skeleton showed that he lived with relatively few ailments and had strong muscle attachments. He also had an unusual benign bone tumor on the front of his right pelvic bone. This whole piece of bone here is not normally there. You can see it, this one as well. I diagnosed this bony growth to be an osteochondroma. While these bone growths are not uncommon today, the location is rare and probably caused some physical discomfort. Most of the people in, in the Tombo Cemetery were buried using Egyptian styles, but two individuals near Tahut and two in a nearby tomb revealed the presence of Nubian body positions at Tombos. Four women, all in the earliest layers of the tomb, were laid to rest in a Nubian flexed burial position, seen here. Interestingly, these burials of Nubian women also contained Egyptian style jewelry, reflecting the multicultural nature of the community, even from the very beginning. Strontium isotope analysis for all of these women buried in the Nubian style indicated that they were local residents. The Egyptian deities Bess and Tawaret were particularly popular, associated with the protection of women and children. This woman, when I excavated her, I thought it was qu quite an unusual position. She's laying back in her tomb. Um, she looks really quite relaxed, but likely her arm, this one here, was probably over her head, which is the traditional position, and her arm was probably pushed aside when tomb robbers came in and tried to grab jewelry at her neck. The burial goods and practices at Tombos tell us that it was important to adhere to these particular traditions, especially those associated with Egyptian religious ideas. We found a coffin with preserved paint, more than we had found in the past. You can see it pictured here. Yellow detail with black figures of deities, and the face was in quite good condition and painted yellow, which indicates in ancient Egypt that it was made for a woman. The woman buried inside had a green glazed steatite scarab found in place on her left hand. We almost always find these scarabs on the left hand. And she was an older woman with scoliosis in her spine. I mentioned the canopic jar stoppers that were found in the tomb of T earlier. This past season, we found a full set of canopic jars dedicated to a man named Happy. You can see some of the hieroglyphics on this one here and over here. Happy was a lector priest, a priest who recited spells and hymns during temple rituals and official ceremonies. Canopic jars were used to hold the separately embalmed internal organs of the deceased who had undergone the most elaborate form of mummification. Ancient tomb robbers had apparently broken each in their search for valuables. You can't see the stoppers on them anymore. They've been set aside. But the jars did actually contain the very degraded remains of internal organs and really our first secure documentation of evisceration at Tombos. The inscription on each, each vessel invokes the protection and blessing of one of the four sons of Horus. You can see pictured here for the four different organs. The practice of evisceration was rare in this period and only for the, for the members of the elite. The appearance of canopic jars indicates the high status of the primary tomb owner in Tombo society. So normally at Tombos, you saw the picture of Tahut's coffin. Uh, termites have reduced the typical wooden coffin to a sad mass of powdery residue, and we're lucky to get a scrap or two of decoration. This past season, one tomb yielded many well-preserved fragments from two coffins, one male and one female, based upon the red and yellow color of the face. They were torn apart by ancient looters, but revealed large sections of inscription and decoration, including the images and protective deities invoked in the spells. A hem nezher priest named Horemhet is mentioned in the coffin fragments, along with a mistress of the house named Becky, presumably his wife. The hem nezher priest, literally divine follower or servant, was important in the temple hierarchy, perhaps serving one of the large temples located 10 kilometers south of Tombos. 
Tomb robbing is known and documented in ancient Egypt since the early dynastic times, so many burials that we excavate have already been disturbed by the ancient inhabitants. Once in a while, we get really lucky. This side niche at the bottom of one of our tomb shafts was, was still found sealed by a mud brick wall. You can see in this drawing here, the mud bricks, and then the goodies inside. Inside, we found an intact burial in a coffin. The coffin had inlaid eyes and a black background that helped us determine when it was made. An elderly, elderly woman was inside. Her grave goods included this blue-green glazed plaque amulet with the goddesses Bat Hathor on one side and Tawaret on the other. She also had a finely carved serpentine, serpentine heart scarab with a human head, pictured here, which provided her name, Weret, and included an appropriate spell from the Book of the Dead. You can read the heart spell here. Also found were several ceramic containers and a bowl, a bowl filled with juniper berries, likely used as a scent or spice for food. Pieces of granite were placed at the shoulders and feet of the coffin to raise it above the floor, perhaps meant to discourage those termites or protect water from seeping in the tomb. This woman lived to old age, and like many older individuals, she had poor dental health, but otherwise showed few signs of sickness. At the depth of approximately two meters, the dis disturbed burial of an adult female was encased in dried, slumped mud in the burial shaft. You can see it here. Because these tombs were used over and over, they were open to put new individuals in. Also, there were tomb robbers. Sometimes um, you can see the evidence of, of rain coming in and other episodes of water. So we do sometimes have mud in them, dried mud. Within her pelvis, though, we found the remains of a close to full-term fetus. You can see the ribs here. The top of the fetus's skull was positioned directly at the bottom of the woman's pelvis, suggesting birth complications. This woman was aged to about 27 to 35 years old and was buried with several nice pieces of jewelry. Another burial in the same area of the cemetery has some interesting physical conditions. This individual experienced prolonged paralysis in the lower half of her body based on the significant amount of atrophy in the long bones of the legs as well as the pelvis. She had a severe angle in her lower spine all of these pathological traits are consistent with this individual having had poliomyelitis in childhood, which can result in paralysis and bone changes such as scoliosis. Poliotype conditions are tested in ancient Egypt, art artistic depictions. You can see this individual here with an atrophied leg. Further down in this tomb, I noted some unusual features of one individual in a small niche. Our conservator, Elizabeth Drolet, helped me consolidate the bones so we could remove them whole since bone preservation was poor for this burial. This person, a female in her 50s, had limb bones that were much shorter than average, about two, one half to two thirds normal size. They were also robust with large muscle attachments and some of them were misshapen, especially the ends of her arm bones here. She has signs of skeletal dysplasia, an abnormal growth of her bones, and one possible diagnosis is dwarfism. One of my PhD students, Katie Whitmore, noted that one of the juveniles buried in a basket in the shaft of the same tomb also looked unusual. The forearm bones appeared misshapen in a similar way to what we saw in the adult, and the age of this child based on dental development was four years old, while the age based on bone size was closer to one year old, suggesting that the child also had a condition that affected growth. The body does appear much smaller than expected for the size of this skull. You can see the basket here, what seems to be a really large head and a small body. Dwarfism is a condition that can be passed from parent to child. And in Egyptian society, society, dwarves held high positions serving pharaohs. And this perhaps could be related to the worship of several dwarf gods, including Ptah and Bes. This is a depiction of a high Egyptian official who had dwarfism. Along with many ceramic, wooden, and stone grave goods, we also have a few examples of animals in the graves. We found the burial of a horse in one tomb, pictured here one of only three non-royal horse burials in Nubia. Also, this last season, we have a small dog placed at the feet of one woman who was buried in a flexed Nubian position. She was over the decayed remains of a large basket and on top of the remnants of a woven reed mat and wearing a leather garment. Another example of a flexed burial comes from one of the later tumulus graves, this Nubian-style structure. 
This woman was well preserved. You can see her laying on her right side with her hands lightly clasped, somewhat under her head. The chamber contained the remnants of a bed. See the remains here. And two large amphora, one with a mud, steel, a mud seal still over the vessel mouth. And she was well preserved, including hair. You can see ringlets of hair in this area. This burial shows the continuation of Nubian burial practices long after the influence of Egypt. She was a middle-aged woman with a recent infection. And you know, while individuals in Nubian burial position make up less than 5% of all burials at Tombos, it is interesting that all of them are women who chose or whose families chose to hold on to these local traditions. The combination of Egyptian and Nubian traditions becomes more common through time at the cemetery. In this Nubian tumulus burial, the body lay extended in an Egyptian position, wrapped in linen inside an Egyptian-style coffin on top of a Nubian-style bed. This young adult male, who showed signs of a childhood nutritional deficiency and a recent infection, also had the remains of a small basket. You can see the round outline here. That contained a flask and a number of fragmentary and whole Egyptian amulets, beads, and a curious assortment of other items. This collection is rather puzzling, but it could represent some sort of ritual cache or perhaps equipment for a magician. Uh, these types of things are common props for magical spells, medical or otherwise. My work at Tombos has revealed that some people lived very long lives and enjoyed the resources of a well-provisioned colonial town. This older man survived many years, though his bones showed signs of activity and injury. He was buried with a nice array of ceramic pottery. His muscle attachments are robust, and he had several injuries that likely would have been very painful. You can see here his vertebrae, parts of his spine were fused together. He also had several broken ribs, as well as a broken far forearm and a broken hand. Maybe he regularly got into fights or, or had some issues during work as well. Beneath him lay the burial of a child. Before a recent development of antibiotics and medical technologies, childhood was especially tough to survive. Some children at Tombos succumbed to these conditions, but most who made it through to adulthood showed few signs of poor health. This child pictured here was laid in the tomb face down. While this is not a common position, we can't necessarily conclude that it was intentional or had some sort of uh, other meaning to it. With the Egyptian mummification practices, bodies are wrapped in many layers of fabric, and the embalmers might have simply lost track of which side was up. Another child's mummy at Tombos, placed face down, had a string of small amulets around his or her neck. This is this picture here, positioned as if the mummy were face up. So this gave us the idea that maybe sometimes people actually just did lose track, since you can see the back of this child's head, but then a, a necklace with, with all the nice things um, facing up. As with these grave goods, significant effort was given to the burials of young people at Tombos. One child in a tumulus grave had this necklace of small scarabs and beads with a gold clasp, um, also ivory bracelets, and laid on a bed. This one here. Through these reconstructions of the young through the old at Tombos, it has been really rewarding to get to know the people who lived and died in the community that I've been researching for many years. It's also been really great to introduce the modern community members in Tombos to the ancient inhabitants. The wonderful, friendly, and welcoming people who we live and work with during our excavations enjoyed hearing about what we found in their ancient history. We've used our findings to prepare teaching materials in English and Arabic for the local elementary school, since their curriculum is lacking in resources for local history. This gentleman here is a teacher at the Tombos Elementary School, but he was actually one of our first workers at the archaeological site. We hire 20 to 30 workers each field season to help us with our excavations. And he was really happy to receive these educational posters to use in our classrooms. Uh, part of our efforts to preserve ancient sites includes, it includes involving the local community. While we know that the ancient Egyptian encounter with Nubia included violent conflict in some interactions, the picture of ancient Tombos is one of resilience. People from different political systems with different religious beliefs and cultural practices formed an integrated community that thrived. 
I hope that you've enjoyed hearing some of my tales from Tombos today. My research and my career have certainly benefited from public interest in ancient Egypt, tombs and skeletons. And as I wrap up, I want to talk a bit here about why this kind of research matters beyond just creating entertaining stories. When we try to understand how past humans lived, we get a glimpse of how we became what we are today. So for instance, we can look at the ep epidemiology of disease in the past. Conditions such as heart disease, cancer, arthritis, osteoporosis, to assist us in tracing the factors that play a role in their occurrence. We are provided with opportunities to investigate how and why we came to look the way we do, live in various climates, adapt to assorted environments, and deal with problems in different ways. Anthropologist Ruth Benedict once said, the purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences. Just as in the past, today's societies grapple with differences between humans. Through our understanding of human differences, we use anthropological data, perspectives, and theory to identify, assess, and solve today's problems. People are multifaceted, and resolutions to these issues require inter interdisciplinary teams with scientists and humanists to take an equally complex approach. At Purdue, a research-intensive university with a public service mission, our broad training in anthropological subfields uniquely positions us to study human diversity through time. Through our integrated approaches to discovery, learning, and engagement, we work with collaborators across campus and beyond to provide training for students to expand human knowledge and address global grand challenges. Thank you all for taking time out of your day to attend my talk. I'd like to acknowledge my major grant supporters, the Natural Science Foundation and National Geographic Society. Um, all of these applications at, aided by sponsored program services. Also the cooperation of the local antiquities service and my terrific team at Tomos. This is our team from the last season. And I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, so, so she asked, how do we determine infection? So when there is some sort of infection, either systemic or something more superficial on the bone surface, uh, the surface of the bone changes. So there tend to be, um, there's, the, there's porosity, there is extra bone growth, and there is destruction of bone that, that tell us that there is some kind of pathogen affecting that individual. Yeah, so that's a great question and something that we're currently grappling with. In general, the preservation of organic remains in the skeleton is very poor in this region because it's so dry. So collagen within the bones is, is very poorly preserved and we haven't had very good luck with the DNA preservation. So in, in theory it's possible, but in reality we haven't gotten to that point where we've had good enough preservation. So there has been some research on the Nubian language, but there is not any written script in Nubia until the Meroitic period, which is about starting about 300 AD, so quite a bit after the Egyptian period. So everything we have is written in Egyptian script. And when the Nubians rule Egypt and Nubia, they're also using Egyptian script. So this work is ongoing, and there is there's not too much indication of them merging, but I feel like we don't really have enough ed evidence yet. To, to understand it. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating that the, um, all of the Nubian births were, or burials were women. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sort of working ideas as to why that's the case? Every time we find one, I look at it and say, it's another woman. <laughs> you know, we only, we have less than 10, but, but it's significant that they're all women. So we're thinking some of, the, some of the ones that we have at the beginning are in these earliest layers. 
We have, you know, evidence from, from other sites that certain Nubian traditions continued after the interaction between the Egyptians and Nubians uh, having to do with uh, cooking and identity and food. I, you know, I, I don't want to assume that it's always women cooking, but in ancient Egypt that certainly was a, a common role. And so there seems to be some kind of um, relationship of holding on to certain traditions, you know, for people within the household. We don't really know who the immigrants from Egypt were, so we don't know that it was just male administrative you know, officials. Uh, when I look at the strontium isotope analysis or the, the cranial measurements, it seems like men and women both are local and, and um, foreign. So that's an interesting question that I haven't fully explored yet, but, but it's a good topic. <laughs> Yeah, it's very common in, in other areas. So it's particularly well developed in South America, in Peru especially, and in Europe. And it all depends on how much variability there is between the place that you uh, originated and where, where you've gone. So not every place is geologically different enough to use this. And so we're still really working out this method in the Nile Valley as more and more sites um, have samples available. Uh, Archaeological remains from Egypt are very difficult to test because uh, most of the remains stay within the country. So I've only tested some material that is in uh, museums that are in other places. And so we don't really have a good sense of the variability in strontium in Egypt yet. Uh, but things are starting to change in terms of the Egyptian Antiquities Department and, and analyses. So we hope to be able to develop this method more. That's a really good question. There are people who, who want me be, to be able to identify individuals, but I would not go that far. I don't think that it's the case that you can do that. So part of my PhD research was to look at a number of different samples from Egypt and Nubia to try to understand the variation between these groups. And there certainly was some variation. So the um, it's mostly in the face where there's variation. and. Egyptians as a whole, ancient Egyptians as a whole, are a pretty similar group. Uh, they, they look similar to one another, but when you look at the Nubians, they are quite variable. Now, this probably has to do with the population history of you know, people coming in from the desert areas and those sorts of things. So I would not be able to identify specifically that this person was Egyptian or Nubian based on their cranial measurements. But as a whole, looking at a sample from a site, I can tell, for instance, at Tombos, that it is not just a group of Egyptian immigrants. It's not e Egyptians just living there in isolation because they don't look like Egyptians that I find in Egypt, right? So I, I can tell by the, the variability within the sample that they are likely a mixed group. So there are some differences between them, but it's not different enough to tell for sure on an individual basis. Which is why I like to use multiple lines of evidence in coming up with these ideas. I had actually two quick questions. Yes. Mind. So one, are the bones left where they're found or are they typically then removed and moved to museums? The second question is actually more about your research team. Mm -hmm. How is it for students and you and such of their hotels? Do you stay with the locals, food, security? Can you say a little about that? So you should come visit my lab because I have many skeletons from Tombos in my laboratory. Uh, in Sudan, they do not have the infrastructure for keeping human skeletal remains. There hasn't been a, a long history of people studying human skeletal remains in Sudan. And so they allow the export of human remains and I curate them in my lab and sometimes have other students and researchers come to look at these remains. So most of the teams that work in Sudan export the remains to their institutions. In terms of working in Sudan, Things have changed dramatically since I was first there. So I first went in 2000, and um, at that time, it took about 18 hours to get to the site from the capital. Uh, we stayed in a hotel. There's a hotel that's run by a Greek family who's been in Sudan for a few generations, and uh, they manage the logistics for nearly every archaeologist working in the country. And this used to be a very long trek through the desert. 
Uh, there were no roads. It took about 18 hours. Now there's a road the entire way. There's cell phone service. There's satellite. There's television. There's, in fact, too much connection. <laughs> I like to be able to get away. Uh, in terms of students, many of my students have said, it's actually much more peaceful here than when I, when, where I grew up. So this is a small agricultural village. I can't even tell you how friendly these people are. They're, I mean, they've become a second family to us since we've been working there for so long. And it's just a really pleasant place to be with, with friendly people who you know, are interested in what we're doing and you know, are living their lives just like we are. We've talked to the community members about it, and they don't. They they have never expressed to us any issues about removing these burials. So most of the sites that we work on, including Tombos, are in areas that they would like to develop, either agriculturally or or building for houses. And so we are, you know, removing them so they no longer are digging them up while they while they develop. And I think in in some sense, while they recognize that these are their ancestors. They are a different religion. You know, everybody who lives in this region, most people who live in this region are Muslim. And these are ancient Egyptians and ancient Nubians who, who to them, had a quite different culture. So perhaps that is, you know, a distinction that they make, that these are not completely our people. They're not of the same culture. But we have had many discussions with them and haven't, haven't encountered issues with, with removing the skeletal remains. That's a good question. <laughs> 